All right, we're back with another overtime, overtime episode number 71. Wait, <laughs> no, <laughs> not that many. <laughs> episode number 31. Uh, and we're back for more Scream uh, with Scream 2 from 1997, only a year after the first one came out. I think I remember seeing that, like, they started working on the second one like six months after the first one um i think the guy uh even had started writing this one in the middle of writing um the first one of course the first one ended up being a huge success so this one came out very soon afterwards um and this one is kind of divisive or what is the divisive between fans is that the right word where I know some people really hate it, some people really like it, some people are in between. Um, I liked it, surprisingly. I wasn't sure how I would feel about it, um, but I liked it. It's not as good as the first one, but I think it's very close. So I'm going to rock a 7 for Scream 2. I tried to pop my knuckle just now, and instead it like jammed it and it really hurt. But, uh, ow, fuck. <laughs> um... But a 7 for Scream 2. Uh, bonus points because this one also has Timothy Oliphant in it. And he's amazing. He's amazing in everything. He's in a remake of The Crazies that I believe was a George A. Romero movie back in the day. And then they remade it. Uh, and I really like that movie. Not a lot of people, I think, care about it or have seen it. But uh, shout out to Timothy Oliphant anyway. Um, but spoiler warning for Scream 2, I'm going to ruin everything about it. So you have been warned. First off, movie starts with, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith and her boyfriend or husband in this movie, which I'm not sure who it's played by. I'm sure someone's famous. I probably should have looked it up before we started. But, you know, I didn't. So, there's that. But uh, they're on their way to a movie. And what the, mo the movie they're going to see is called Stab. And it is based on the book that was written by Courtney Cox's character after the events of the last movie. So, the whole movie Stab is like the re uh the reenactment of the first scream movie when we get to the theater we see like the beginning is the drew barrymore open they even recreate the the stab you know from the from the back and everything but they go see a movie called stabbed uh jay pinkett smith doesn't want to be there she doesn't like horror movies but her husband does um she says it's just a bunch of white bitches getting killed uh, she talks about how it's like known that horror excludes like the African people or whatever, um, which, you know, you can't really, I mean, the stereotype is that the black character always gets killed first, which spoiler for in a little bit, that does end up happening. But, uh, but anyway, uh, they get to the theater, they're handing out fucking ghost face masks and shit. The theater's wild. Everyone's running around hype as fuck for this movie. Uh, it legit looks like the Spider-Man No Way Home um, movie theaters where everyone's dressed up as Spider-Man. I don't know this new Scream that just dropped. I don't know if anyone's dressing up as Ghostface, but I haven't seen anything on it. But this theater is crazy. It's packed. Um, they they get to their seats. Uh, they the the whole like I said the movie starts. It's the Drew Barrymore scene. Um, she does end up getting, like, naked, uh, but you don't see anything, but Jada Pinkett Smith is like, now what, what does that have to do to further the plot, and everyone, and the dude is like, I don't know about the plot, but I sure got a stiffy from it, and she's like, well, you better loosen up your wrist, because you ain't getting nothing from me, you know, um, and, uh, I thought for a minute that, because in the first scream, I talked about how the beginning reminded me of Psycho, how they kill off the, like, main build person like immediately um i kind of thought they were going to do that with the reenactment of drew barrymore scene where she was getting the shower ready and i thought they were going to do like ghost face open in the shower and killing her but it doesn't he just ends up like 
doing the whole phone call deal again. Um, Jada Pickens Smith is do is like, bitch, just hang up the phone. <laughs> She's like yelling out the scream or the screen. People are like, hey, shut the fuck up, you know. Um, it's clearly if you if you haven't seen Scary Movie. I think it was the first one that happened, but it might have been the second one where uh, they do the spoof um, with, God, I can't remember her fucking name, but they recreate this scene and she gets stabbed and shit and everyone like cheers when she dies and stuff. Um, but anyway, J.D. Pinkett Smith uh, is like, all right, I, I'm going to go get some popcorn, you know? So she goes to get her some popcorn um, she overhears people talking about how they shouldn't be watching a movie like this because it's based on true events and it's just glorifying the acts of, of a murderer. They only mention Billy a lot. They don't mention Stu a lot in this movie, um, which is kind of weird. Like the whole thing is they're like, he, the, the killer wants to be just like Billy Loomis or whatever. So she overhears that she gets her popcorn. She heads back to the theater on her way there. Her husband jumps out of a closet and he's wearing a ghost face mask and he scares her. And she's like, what the fuck are you doing? You know, and he's like, oh, I'm just playing. Um, and he's like, listen, if you don't like this movie, we can go see. Uh, what She wanted to go see like some fucking chick flick. I don't remember who was the star of the movie she wanted to see. But Jay Pink Smith is like, we're here already. We might as well just watch the movie. Um and her husband's like, all right, cool. I'm going to go to the bathroom real fast. So she goes back in the movie. He goes to the bathroom. Uh, the two uh, urinals are taken. So he goes into one of the empty stalls. And as he gets done pissing, he just starts hearing this whispering in the stall next to him of someone going, I'm sorry, mommy. I'm sorry, mommy. You know, uh, and he's like snickering and he puts his ear up to the to the wall to listen in more. And just, Ghostface on the other side just stabs through the wall and into, like, the dude's, like, cheek or, you know. I thought he was going to go straight through the ear. Um, but he stabs him through the stall and dude falls down. And it's like, it was really cool. Um, we go back to the theater and as Jada Pinkett is watching the movie... Ghostface sits next to her and now he's dressed up just like her husband except he's wearing a ghost face mask and he isn't talking and shit uh they watch the movie for a little bit it gets to the part where uh Drew Barrymore fake Drew Barrymore on the screen is about to get stabbed and uh Jada Pickens starts going like this is it this is it and she leans over to hug her husband because she's scared of the movie and as she does it she feels something on her hand, and she's like, what the fuck? And she pulls her hand back, and her hand's covered in blood. And she's like, oh, shit. So, uh, Ghostface then stabs her in the side, and she's like, what the fuck? And she gets up and starts to walk away, but Ghostface just follows her and stabs her again. And the whole theater is, like, going crazy about what's going on on the movie, and they're, like, hooting and hollering and shit. So no one notices as she's walking down the aisle, Ghostface just like, he stabs her a good eight, nine times while she's walking down the aisle. Um, and no one notices it until she climbs up in front of the movie th screen and she just lets out this fucking death wail. Um, and then she falls over dead. Uh, and that is the very beginning of the movie. Is the uh, Jada, which is a pretty famous death scene. I'm sure some of you have probably seen it. If you haven't watched this movie, that might be the the thing you know from it the most is the Jada Pinkett Smith uh, death screen. But she dies, we cut to a title card, and then we immediately go to Sidney Prescott, who now I believe is at some type of college or art college or some weird type of school. And she's in her dorm, and she gets a phone call from this dude who's like, what's your favorite scary movie, Sidney? And he's using the voice thing. But 
Sydney got smart and she has caller ID now. So she's like, is this Gregory uh, Steven from Alabama or something? And he's like, oh shit, how the fuck did you know that? Uh, and he hangs up. So it's good to see. I, I'll give screen characters this. For the most part, they are smart about what they do and don't do. And so I, I, I like that they gave Sydney the caller ID shit. Because, you know... Immediately, if everything that happened in that first movie happened to you, you'd be like, I need some fucking caller ID. Nowadays, everyone has that shit. But back in the day, that was like brand new technology. Um, she hangs up the phone. She goes downstairs. And the TV is on where her uh, roommate or friend is. I'm not really sure. But uh, the news is on, on the TV, and she sees that Cotton Weary is getting interviewed on, like, the Today Show or something. And uh, he's free now after the events of the first one because Billy and Stu uh, were eventually convicted of killing Sidney's mom, and he was found innocent. Uh, and so he is in the clear as of this movie. Uh, Sydney still, though, looks, like, uncomfortable about him being, uh, out and about, which, um, you know, I can understand, like, sh that was the guy that forever she thought raped and killed her mom, and now he's just, like, walking around, so I get it's kinda, you know, um, where she's apprehensive about him being out, uh, and she might still, even after everything with Stu and Billy, she might still think, hey, wait a minute, you know, this motherfucker might have had something to do with it, um, they turn off the TV, their, uh, Sydney and her friend are about to leave, but as they're leaving, their other friend walks up to them and tells them to turn on the news again, where they see, uh, about the Jada Pinkett Smith murder and her husband's murder at the opening of Stab that night, uh, and apparently they were also seniors at this school that Sydney is going to. Um, I think I heard it correctly, that they were seniors at that school. Which, they look like very old seniors, but, you know, at that point, if it's a college and you're senior, what are you, 20, 24? Is that how college works? Graduate high school at 18? Maybe 4? I don't know. Anyway, but they looked pretty old to be seniors at this fucking school, but, you know, whatever. Um, in class that day, uh, we meet... Sort of the main group, Randy is back, played by Jamie Kennedy once again. He has a sweet, like, little goatee now. Uh, I really like Randy's look better in this movie um, than I did in the first one. I think I like Randy, this might be contra, I think I liked Randy better in this movie than I did in the last one. I don't know, Randy was kind of a, I know, like, people like him. But Randy was kind of a nothing character, you know? And he kind of, still kind of is in this movie. Spoiler! He's not the killer in this movie. And I kind of wish he was. I kind of wish they made Randy the killer. Like, I don't know why, but I, it just feels like they, that should have happened. Randy should have been the killer. Maybe Scream 5. Maybe he'll <laughs> he'll show up and be the killer. But, uh... Randy's here. Timothy Oliphant is here. I want to say his character's name is Mickey. Um, and then... Also, I think here at the same time is we'll learn is Sydney's uh, new boyfriend, Derek. But they're all in this like film class and shit, like I said. And they have this big long discussion about how um, sequels, you know, were never as good as their predecessors. And, you know, getting meta again because this is, you know, everyone likes Scream so much and now they're making Scream 2. Uh, and they have this big whole discussion on, you know, sequels and. They talk about, uh, they're like, who would want to make a sequel? They all suck dick, you know? Uh, finally, I don't remember who it was. I think maybe Randy was like, we'll name a sequel that's better than the first. Um, one dude says Aliens, which they kind of argue about, but I've heard, uh, you know, uh, I've always heard that the Aliens, a lot of people like Aliens better than Alien. It's been so long since I've watched them, I don't have an opinion on either of those. Uh... Timothy Oliphant says T2, which, you know, and they're like, you got a hard on for camera. He's like, ah, you know, whatever. And then someone says, like, House 2, which I don't think I've watched a single House film. Um, but they, like, boo him. They're like, get the fuck out of here. What are you talking about? 
And then finally, Timothy Oliphant's like, I got it. The Godfather 2. And everyone's like, oh, yeah. Uh, which is bullshit, ladies and gentlemen. I know The Godfather 2 is supposed to be, like, the tippy top of what a movie should be. I like The Godfather better than The Godfather 2. Even though The Godfather 2 does have... Spoiler. When the wife... I think it's Godfather 2. When the wife uh, has, like, the abortion... And then later when she's talking to Al Pacino, she's like, they told you I had an abortion? No, I fucking, uh, or uh, they told you I had a miscarriage? No, I had an abortion. I would never want another child with you or whatever. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> but but uh, I, I think The Godfather is better than The uh, the Godfather too. But, you know. Anyway, they have their little discussion. Uh, class is dismissed. And Sydney goes uh, and meets up with Randy as he's coming out of the classroom. She tells him that a new killer is back. She says it, it involves them somehow, like the killer is going to come after them. And Randy is like, it doesn't involve us anyway. He also puts on a weird British accent in the scene, which he never does again. But maybe it's just because he's practicing or something. I don't know, but it just seemed weird. Um, but he's like, no, it doesn't have anything to do with us. You know, that's behind us. As they're as they're talking is when Sydney's new boyfriend Derek walks up, uh, and we learn their boy because they immediately just start like making out and shit. And poor Randy, who has a crush on Sydney, is just having to watch you know watch her make out with this dude, uh, and he's like, "Oh man," and he walks off. Uh, Courtney Cox shows up, and she has a sweet new like black and red streaked hairdo uh she gets interviewed by this random girl who says like she's a practice she just started like uh working in this field of media or news or whatever and how uh courtney cox is like her inspiration and shit and she gets interviewed by her uh, and she's asked, she asks Courtney Cox what she thinks about the fact that her book and now the movie, uh, attribute to this violence that's being, uh, you know, occurring. And Courtney Cox is like, fuck off. It doesn't have anything to do with me. There's a lot of that, that in this movie. There's a lot of, um, like discussion about movies being blamed for violence and, no video game or music talk, but that's always, it's always movies, video games, and, uh, and, and music. Did I say music? Uh, anyway, but they always, you know, attribute that. I think, wasn't there even a thing where there was a ghost face killer? Like, that was, not the rapper, but the, uh, <laughs> wasn't it like a thing where someone dressed up as ghost face and killed someone or something? But, anyway, there's a lot of that discussion throughout this movie. Uh, Randy, uh, they're having a town meeting, by the way. That's why Courtney Cox is here. It's like the, the mayor or the cop or the sheriff of the town is having a meeting. That's why Courtney Cox shows up because she's trying to interview him as he's having this meeting. Um, Randy and the group of friends see Courtney Cox as she shows up and Randy is like, damn, she even got calf implants, you know, because now she's got this money from being the successful author and shit. Uh, as this is happening, these random sorority girls show up and tell Sydney and Sydney's friend how they like want her to join the sorority they're in and they're having a party that night and all this shit. And Sydney and them are like, sure, you know, we'll, we'll come over. And those fucking sorority girls have no point in being in this movie. I don't know why they were added, but they, they're there for some reason, these sorority girls. Um, so then, uh, the Sydney randomly as they're talking just goes like, oh my God, you know? And they're like, what's the deal? And then it pans over and you just see Dewey just like standing under a tree, just like sort of turning in a circle. Like he's not doing anything. He looks so fucking lost. And, uh, Sydney runs up to him. And she gives him a hug and shit. And she's like, what are you doing here? Uh, and Dewey basically is like, I'm here to check on you, you know. He tells her that, you know, he thinks someone is trying to follow in Billy Loomis's steps. Uh, and he tells her if 
if it is, it's probably someone she knows, um, you know, and she needs to be on the lookout. And Sydney's like, what do you want me to do? Just like stop talking to everyone I know, you know? She's like, I thought we were over this. And Dewey's like, I'm just saying, be safe. Um, right after that, as Dewey is leaving, uh, or no, as Sydney's leaving, uh, Courtney Cox bombards her with an interview with Cotton Weary. She says, she's like, we got a special guest reunited for the first time, Cotton Weary and Sydney Prescott. And she just pulls him out. And Cotton Weary's like, hey, Sydney, you know, um, Sydney is like, what the fuck is going on? She's like, what are you doing? And, uh, Courtney Cox is like, come on, you know, this is, this is the man you put in prison for a year, uh, who was innocent and whatever. And Sydney just straight up like backs hand, backhands Courtney Cox and knocks her down. Uh, and her friend looks at the cameraman, the, the new cameraman in this movie and goes, did you get that on film? And the camera go, the cameraman goes, yes, I got that on film. And like, it was, it was funny. Did you get that on film? Yes, I got that on film. And, uh, and Sydney and the friends walk off and then, uh, well, it turns out Cotton Weary, like, was sort of innocent in that. He thought that she knew he was coming, uh, to be part of this interview. He was like, you didn't fucking tell her? And Courtney Cox was like, I, well, listen. Uh, she owed me or something. And Cotton Weary was like, well, no wonder she freaked out. So Cotton seemed like a, seems like a nice guy in that little scene. He didn't seem like, like during the interview, he was like, listen, I have no hard feelings. You know, I forgive you. I'm just trying to get past it and all this shit. So Cotton Weary seemed like a nice guy in that scene. Uh, then as Courtney leaves, she runs into Dewey and Dewey is really hurt by how he was written in her book. She was talked about how like he smelled of uh, amateur. He smelled of what the fuck is amateurish? That's not the word. <laughs> he sp anyway. He was a rookie, and she was you know he was nervous and he was goofy and th just the way she wrote about him, and he's real upset about it. Um, and he tries to be like super hard on her. And he's like, you're just a mediocre writer and all this shit. But, like, the harder he tries, she just keeps smiling more and more. Because it's just funny watching him try to be angry, you know. Um, and he tries to apologize to her. Or, or she tries to apologize to him. And he's like, no. You know, and he walks off. It was during this scene that I noticed his hand looked real fucked up. Like, he was holding it like this. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? And then, uh, as the movie goes on, he, I noticed him limping. I was like, what the, what the fuck? And then later we learned that he got nerve damage from being stabbed in the back. Presumably it hit his spine or whatever. And that's why he was all fucked up. So I'm glad they explained it. I also think it's kind of cool that they have lasting effects from what happened in the last movie coming over. Because usually you'll see where people get fucked up next movie. They're pe perfectly fine. But Dewey has like... Still side effects from the shit that happened. So that night, uh, we come, we have a scene of this girl who, it, uh, it was the girl who ran up to Sydney and them and told them to turn on the news to see uh, about the murders last night. And she's at her sorority house by herself. I think she's the uh, sober girl in case any of the other girls need to ride home after they're done partying and stuff like that. Um, and she's home alone, uh, but then she, uh, she gets a phone call from who she thinks is her boyfriend, but very quickly she learns that it's not and shit, uh, and he immediately starts being creepy with her again. Uh, meanwhile, in the background, Nosferatu is on the TV. Shout out to Nosferatu. Go check out the overtime we did on Nosferatu that turns 100 years old this year. Shout out to Nosferatu. Uh, the dude on the phone is eventually like, do you want to die tonight? You know, and she hangs up on him and calls her friend, uh, who she was talking to on the phone earlier back. And, uh, as she does this, she hears a noise upstairs and she's like, I don't think I'm alone in the house. So she goes walking upstairs as she does this. Her friend is on the phone and she's doing a fucking, uh, kill, 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 die, 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 you know? Uh, and eventually 
after she hears so many noises, she's like, fuck this. And she runs out the front door. But she just stands outside her door because she tries to call campus police. But she doesn't get good reception outside. So she has to walk back inside. Um, and as she does, her other friend shows up like out of nowhere. And uh, she's like, oh, my, my keys were here. Or I hadn't left yet or something. So the girl is like, fuck me. And she thinks it was just her friend that was making all these noises. And she thinks it was just like a prank call that, you know, called her. So she goes, uh, as she's talking to her friend, though, she, uh, uh, we see in the background, Ghostface just like slithers his way in and hides in a closet. And then the phone rings again and the girl's uh, friend picks it up. And Ghostface tells the friend to tell the other girl that it's Ted, her boyfriend. So the girl gets the phone and she's like, Ted? And then Ghostface is like, nah, but I bet you wish it was, bitch. You know, <laughs> he's like, I got you. Uh, so uh, he tells uh, the girl, he's like, set the alarm, you know. So she goes and sets the alarm and then she hangs up. She gets another phone call. Um... But as she goes to answer it, it was just like a decoy because Ghostface used it for as she goes to pick it up. He jumps out of the closet behind her. And we get another classic Ghostface chase where he's just getting like hit with flower pots and shit. And uh, she's running away. She breaks the patio window as she's running that like goes over this balcony. And it sets off the alarm. So now the cops are coming. But it fucks her up running through the, the, the glass. And she's on her knees and Ghostface comes up behind her and stabs her in the back uh, a couple of times. And then for good measure, he tosses her off of the balcony and she is dead. We go over to the party that the sorority girls were hosting. And Sydney and her friend are there. And I like this touch. They have it so Randy, Derek, and Timothy Oliphant all show up late. So it makes them like or you know like hey these guys were weren't at the party while this murder happened so it's like oh shit what, what you know i like that touch that all three of those guys showed up late um they're uh th they don't get into the party very long until like one of the sorority girls is like hey there's a bunch of cops over at fucking the the the, the other house or whatever and they walk over and it's, they see about the dead girl and all this shit. The news people are showing up. Courtney Cox once again runs into uh, that the, the girl from earlier who was trying to interview her and shit. And that girl was there before anyone. She like got the scoop on it all and told Courtney Cox. She's like, oh, some girl got thrown off the balcony or whatever. And so Courtney Cox is trying to get the scoop. Uh, but she runs into Dewey once again. Uh, as all this shit's happening and she's like, uh, she's like, it's happening again, isn't it? And Dewey is like, oh, you would love that, wouldn't you? So you could write another book, you know? Uh, and he walks off and once again, you know, he's just upset about the way she wrote about him and shit. That night when Sydney's back at home, she gets a call from Ghostface. Uh, she's like... This was cool as fuck because she's talking to him and Ghostface is talking shit. And at this point, she knows this is like legit Ghostface. This is the guy who's killing people. And she's like, if you're so tough, why don't you show your face? And behind her, we hear my pleasure. And she turns around and Ghostface is there. And I realized that was the first time that you had heard Ghostface talk in person like that. Because every other time he'd been on the phone. And then when he was in front of someone, he would never talk, you know? So I was like, oh, that's cool that they added he's talking. And, and obviously he has the voice thing in front of, you know, in his mask or whatever. But uh, I thought that was, it was cool the way they, because you hear behind her, like, my pleasure. And she turns around, Ghostface is there. He chases her. Uh, as he's chasing her around, we see Derek outside of the window. And so we're like, okay, well, Derek's right there. You know, I see that. Uh, she manages to get away from him. And get outside. And Derek is like, stay here. I'm going to go get him. So Derek goes running the house. She's like, fucking idiot. Why are you going in there, you know? Uh, Dewey shows up as all this is happening. And this is when I really noticed that he was fucked up. He was limping and shit. And he goes running in with his gun. Uh, 
And by the time he gets in there, Ghostface is gone, but he, like, slashed up Derek's arm and shit. So Derek's fucked up, so they gotta take him to the hospital. At the hospital, Timothy Oliphant is there, and he, like, consoles Sydney. Um, you know, and he's like, you know, we're with you. Uh, he's like, sit, or he's like, Derek's lucky he didn't get killed. Who in their right mind would go back in the house anyway? And it makes, like, this ominous fucking noise. And at first, I thought they were going to do some shit where they were going to ask Timothy Oliphant, like, how did you know he went back in the house, you know? But really what it was is because then, right after that, as we go into um, Derek's hospital room, Dewey is standing there, and they talk about how, why wouldn't Ghostface kill you instead of just, like, slashing you or whatever, and Dewey's like, yeah, it's kind of suspicious, you know? And Derek's like, what's well, suspicious that you showed up after everyone was gone and shit? And so once again, it's this whole who done it, and everyone's kind of blaming each other, you know? But so now it's suspicious that Derek didn't get killed. He only got hurt, and Dewey showed up late again. And yeah, and that's all this shit. Um... After that, I believe it's Courtney Cox who figures out that all the people who have been killed by the victim or killed by the murder in this movie have the same name in some capacity as the victims from the first one. Like their first name would be the same as uh as like the girl who got killed by with the garage door and one of their last names was like Drew Barrymore's name and you know all this shit. So that's when they're like, this is, this is a, like a copycat killer, you know? Um, later on, we get a scene where Sydney tells Derek, he's like, she's like, you need to stay away from me. She's like, I don't want you getting hurt. You already got slashed up. Everyone gets hurt that's staying around me, you know? But he doesn't really buy it. He's like, is this really you worried about me or is this just you not believing that I'm not the one trying to kill you you don't trust me um and she's like i just need you to stay away you know uh after that we get another scene of courtney cox trying to convince dewey that she's sorry and that she wants to team up with him to find the killer uh but he he once again he's like no you know right after that that same reporter who uh is at every crime scene and shit and keeps trying to interview courtney cox shows up uh, and she tries to interview her but Courtney Cox is like, will you fuck off, you know? Uh, I think she tried to say something bad about Dewey. And Courtney Cox was like, no, Dewey's one of the good guys, unlike us, you know? Um, talking about the media, who all they care about is, like, the scoop and all that shit. Uh, that day, we cut to the cafeteria. And Timothy Oliphant is sitting next to... Or no, maybe he's sitting in front of Derek. Maybe that's who he's talking to at this point. But he says... Yeah, he does. He's talking to Derek. He tells uh, Derek that he thinks it's Randy that's killing people. And Derek is like, Randy's harmless and shit. Uh, and Timothy Oliphant is like, yeah, that's what the same thing they said about Dahmer, you know? Uh, and once again, we'll learn later that that Randy isn't the killer. But I, I wish that Randy was the killer. Like, I think he deserved it. <laughs> he should have been the fucking killer. Um, but... Uh, Later, they're joined at the at the table by Sydney's friend and Sydney, which I thought was weird because Sydney had told Derek that she, you know, wanted him to stay away from her, but she sits at the same table with him. And then, ladies and gentlemen, we get the worst fucking scene of the whole movie, uh, of the whole series so far. Uh, it's it's just cringy. It's not good. I don't know why the fuck it's here. Where Derek starts to sing an acapella like, I love you, baby, in the fucking cafeteria. And Timothy, and he's standing on top of the tables. Timothy Oliphant is like cheering him on. Everyone starts clapping and shit. Um, fucking, he gets done, and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, and it wins like Sydney over. There's a black dude standing there that like gives. Derek a high five and I was like no the no I was like these kids would punch Derek in the fucking face if he ever tried to do some dumb shit like that uh and then I think he might even 
he might even smooch uh, Sydney after that. And I was just glad when it was fucking over because it was terrible. And I don't know why the fuck it was in the movie. Um, also, before that scene's over, he gives Sydney his, uh, like, frat necklace that has, like, his symbol on there or whatever. And they go over some bullshit about how, like, if you give your shit to a girl, you can get beaten up for it. It's a bunch of shit that doesn't fucking matter. And, uh, yeah. Um, well, it does matter just for one reason later on, but it's fucking, they could have came up with any reason to have this guy tied up at the end. Spoiler, that he's tied up at the end. Um, on the news, uh, Randy and Dewey see a recreation of the hallway scene where Billy, uh, and Sydney, you know, run into each other. And that's the scene where he talks about, you know, she doesn't give out anymore. And, you know, she hasn't been the same since her mother died and all that shit. Uh, Sydney is played by Luke Wilson, which is pretty funny. Or not Sydney. That would be even funnier if Sydney was played by Luke Wilson. But Billy is played by Luke Wilson. Sydney is played by someone who I can't remember, but she's famous. And then apparently Dewey is played by David Schwimmer, uh, which you know that that's cool. Shout out to David Schwimmer. Um, as they're talking, Randy starts listing like uh, horror movie sequel tropes. He's talking about you know bigger body count, more elaborate death scenes. Uh, but before he can get the three, Dewey, like, cuts him off. And he, he's like, listen, just help me. Who the fuck do you think it is? He's like, since you're so smart. Um, and Randy theorizes that it could be Courtney Cox killing people. He says that, you know, she might have a new book coming out. She might be running out of fucking things to talk about. So all of a sudden you create this new copycat killer. And it's a whole new story, whole new book, you know, whole new movie later. Um, a la Nightcrawler with Jake Gyllenhaal, where he started kind of making his own crime scenes and shit. Um, but that's what he theorizes. And, uh, and Dewey's like, no, Courtney, Courtney Cox wouldn't do that, you know? So, after that, uh, oh, also in that scene is when Courtney Cox or, uh, Dewey talks about how he's got, uh, nerve damage, and that's when we learn why he's all fucked up. After that scene, Courtney Cox's new cameraman uh, is like, "Hey, I read your book. Uh, uh, I read the book you wrote. Your last cameraman got fucking killed." And she's like, "Yeah, it was just a, it was just a, uh, you know, it's a thing that come came with the job. It was, you know, inescapable. I think it was some weird shit." And the dude was like, "Listen, brothers don't last long and shit like this, you know." He is like, I'm out of here. But she manages to convince him to stay. But he's very not happy about it. Um, then some bullshit scene happens where Sydney is like contemplating leaving like her theater class. But her fucking her teacher convinces her not to. And then they go straight into uh, rehearsing this movie where I think it was like the fall of. Greece? That's not right. The Fall of Atlas? Is that a fucking... And so I, th I read what f f fucking play it was, but I can't remember. But she's in the middle of, like, the circle of dudes who are wearing these masks. And then the part in the play is they start to, like, go to stab her. But in the middle of all this, she sees one wearing the ghost face mask and is, like, legit trying to stab her. So she's running around, everyone's swarming her and shit, and eventually she starts screaming, and that finally causes the uh, director dude to be like, alright, everyone stop, and we see Ghostface kind of slip out the uh, the back of the group of people, um, and he manages to go. Right after that, though, uh, Sydney is in like the back, and Derek shows up to walk her home, but now she's like super fucking skeptical about them and she's like listen don't come near me she's like until this is over don't come near me you know and he's like do i get any say in this and she's like no and he's like uh, all right you know so she leaves or, or he leaves we then cut to a scene of randy dewey and courtney cox uh in like this little s town square area and they're talking about how they're going to catch the killer and shit. Uh, but as they're talking about it, they happen to get a phone call from him. 
and they're able to figure out, well, hey, the killer is watching them right now. So they're like, we need to just look for someone on a cell phone, you know? So Randy is talking to him. Courtney Cox and Dewey start, like, walking around. Uh, Randy runs up on this girl holding a cell phone and scares the shit out of her, but she's nothing. Courtney Cox takes someone else's cell phone and, like, is like, who is this? You know, and starts talking to him, but it's nothing. But as that happens, Dewey is like, hey, we got a white a white male on his phone looking suspicious at 12 o'clock or whatever. And behind them, you see a guy who's out of focus, like on a cell phone looking at him. And then as they turn to look, he like slips behind the wall um, to leave or whatever. So they're like, oh, shit. Uh, Randy, who is talking to the killer still. Uh, the killer tells Randy that he'll never be the leading man and he'll always be an extra and shit. And Randy is like, fuck you. <laughs> He's so offended. Uh, and then right after that, the guy who was talking on the cell phone, with fucking Dewey dives, dive bombs him. He's like up on this little ledge and he jumps down on top of the guy and takes his cell phone. And the guy's like, what the fuck? But, it, it, once again, he's talking to, like, his girlfriend on the phone or whatever. So, he's innocent. And then, Randy is still talking to the killer. And he's backing up. And he's like, well, you're not going to get away with this. We're going to find you and shit. And then, he backs up straight towards this van and gets pulled in. And the Randy is fucking stabbed to death inside this van. They killed off Jamie Kennedy. Uh, Randy is gone. Which I believe I watched a thing with Jamie Kennedy where he talked about how they believed, like, if they killed Randy, it would make it so people were like, well, if they kill fucking Randy, anyone's going to die, you know? Um, but, but yeah, and, they, and Courtney Cox and Dewey eventually find him and he's covered in blood and shit. But not to fear, because Courtney Cox's cameraman shows up right after all this uh, with two boxes of Dunkin' Donuts. So, <laughs> they have some donuts they can eat, but, uh, but Randy is dead, so, Randy is not the killer. He didn't pull a Billy Loomis, he didn't fucking, uh, just fake his death to then throw the people off his scent, you know? Sydney gets a message, she's at the library, she's on a, on a computer, and she gets a message on her computer, and she asks the guy, uh, sitting next to it. She's like, how the fuck did I get this message? And the guy tells her that all the computers in the library are synced together. So the, anyone in here can send her a message. Um, and she opens it up and it says, you're going to die tonight, you know? So she's like, oh shit. So she gets up. There's two like federal agents who showed up earlier on in the movie who are here to like look for the killer. And they're there. And they pull her over to the side and they're like, all right, stay here. And they start going to everyone's computer to, uh, you know, see if they're the ones who sent the, the message. But as they're doing this, Cotton Weary shows up next to Sydney, which is very bad timing for Cotton Weary that he would show up right after this fucking, I'm going to, you know, you're going to die tonight message. But he pops up next to her and he's super like suspect in this fucking scene. He's super hostile. He's like grabbing her arm and he tells her, he's like, I got an offer from Diane Sawyer. She says she'll give us the full hour if we come on there and talk to her and shit. But Sydney is like, I just want to move past it. And the dude is like, listen, you took a fucking year away from my life and shit. And he's yelling at her. Um, and uh, she tries to walk away, but he follows her. And he's like, all right, ju just walk away then, fucking bitch or whatever. And this causes the cops to be like, what the fuck? So they grab Cotton Weary. And next thing you know, they fucking haul him off to jail. They're like, you're the one who did it, you know? So he's getting interviewed at the police station. He's like, all I did was yell at her. He's like, I got aggravated and I yelled at her. I didn't fucking murder anyone, you know? Um, at the police station, Sydney is told by Dewey, I believe, that Randy was killed. And she now is like, it should have been me. You know, Randy was innocent and all this shit. She's like, everyone around me is dying, all this fucking stuff. The cops don't have anything on Cotton, so they have to let him go. On his way out, he runs into Courtney Cox, who there even seems to be a little bit of, like, Courtney Cox wondering if she got it wrong. It may be Cotton Weary. 
maybe not even that he did murder Sydney's mom, but maybe he's not like this innocent man that she thought he was. Um, but he leaves. Once again, that same fucking reporter girl who keeps trying to interview Courtney Cox is there uh, as Courtney Cox comes out of the police station. And once again, Courtney Cox is like, I get you're fucking obsessed with me, but she's like, fuck off, go interview someone else. And so the woman's like, sorry, sorry, you know. Uh, after this is when Courtney Cox Cameron finally comes up to her and is like, all right, here's your footage. Uh, I'm out of here. And he legit, he, you see him in the background. He gets in a taxi and leaves the movie. The most just reasonable character. He's like, people are dying around here. I'm out of here. And the cameraman fucking leaves. Um, and as he's leaving, Courtney Cox starts talking to Dewey again. She tells him that she legitimately feels bad about everything that's happening, happened. And all she wants to do is find the killer. Uh, and Dewey finally agrees to team up with her. Uh, Courtney Cox then comes up with a, a thing where she says, well, I think like they were filming at every location. So she says if they go through all their tape and they see the same person at every crime scene, then they could probably figure out who the killer is. So they head to like this big fucking theater looking place. I think it might have been the theater um, that that Sydney was doing her her rehearsal earlier. And they go and they start to load up the footage. But man, they don't even get like five minutes in the footage before Dewey and her just start making out. Uh, they're straight up about to bone. But then uh, another little TV clicks on uh, next to the big screen. And Courtney Cox is like, hey, wait a minute. But Dewey is like, has a, f a handful of tit. And so he's like, he's like, huh? You know? And she has to be like, hey, that's not my footage. And so they watch it. And it's a camera from the uh the 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 killer's point of view which to me kind of seemed like they gave away the killer right there like the fact that they have this news lady who's shown up just randomly and is there every crime scene always trying to interview courtney cox and now they have a thing where the the video camera someone's videoing all the i was like hmm you know uh but as they're watching it, it turns into like a Spaceballs moment where then it cuts to like a live shot of them from the back. And they're like, what the fuck? And they look and Ghostface is up in like the uh, the, the the light box up in the, up in the top. So Dewey runs up there. Uh, and as he gets up there, he's like, hey, Ghostface is gone by this point. And so he calls down to Courtney Cox. He's like, he's gone. But then Ghostface pops up uh, behind fucking uh courtney cox and starts chasing her and shit and she runs away from him and goes into like this audio recording station where they have a piano and like sound sound foam what is that called anyone that you know you guys know what i'm talking about and she's in there um and ghostface comes in after her and she's like hiding behind the sound, the 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 sound foam shit, and she's like slithering through the different things. But she ends up only being able to make it to the audio booth, where it's like the engineer booth, where they control the the mixers and all that shit. So she gets in there, uh, and she like locks the door. As she does this, Dewey comes walking in. And he sees her behind the glass, and he, like, goes and is like, hey, hey, Courtney, you know? Uh, also, her name in these movies is Gail Weathers, but I just call her Courtney Cox, uh, you know. But but he's, like, knocking on, but she can't hear her because these engineer booths are, like, soundproof, um, unless they have the button hit or whatever. So he's knocking on the wind, or the, the, the glass, but she doesn't hear her, uh, or she doesn't hear him. And then Ghostface comes up behind Dewey, and fucking stabs him in the back again. And then I believe Dewey somehow hits the the speaker button. And now she can hear him. And she turns around and Dewey like slides down the glass. Bloody mouth. blood, And just blood smearing. Courtney Cox is crying. You know. Uh, all this shit. And then Ghostface then drops Dewey. And then tries to bust in through the door. But she kicks over like this big shelf in front of the door. To block Ghostface from coming in. Uh, 
and I was like, oh, shit, they got Dewey, you know? Uh, no, I wasn't, because, spoiler, I knew that he was in all these other movies. I mean, there's this, but... And it kind of seems cheap that they would do two fucking fake-out deaths of Dewey back-to-back. Especially this one. This one was, like, a real... This motherfucker dead, you know? Um, so, anyway, as Ghostface leaves, we cut to a scene of Sydney. She's leaving town with uh, the two federal agents that were with her. Uh, Derek comes up to her and is like, hey, when all this is over... You know, I'll still be here. And Sydney gives him a kiss. And as she gets in the car, her friend is coming with her that's been that's been in the movie the whole time. And uh, they start to head out of town. As they leave, uh, the boyfriend gets jumped by his fraternity mates. Uh, fraternity brothers, whatever you fucking call them. And they're like, you gave your letters, your symbols away or some shit. Uh, and they carry him to this house party where they tie him up. On what I thought was like a sun, but then I think it might have been a star later. But they tie him up, and they're like splashing beer on him and shit. And that was the whole reason that he gave, that they had the whole explanation for the, you get jumped for giving away your letters or whatever, is to get him tied up on this fucking uh, sun or star. As Sydney and her friend are driving with the feds, they get stopped at a red light. This town is fucking deserted. I don't know if ever maybe there was a curfew again, or maybe everyone had left, or I don't I don't know what the fuck was going on. But it's fucking deserted and they're stuck at this red light, and then Ghostface pops up next to the driver at the red light and he stabs through the glass and slits the guy's throat. Um He then uh goes over to the other driver or he like hops over the roof and pulls out the other driver and fucks him up he like stomps him and stabs him some Ghostface gets into the car he starts to try to drive off but the cop gets up and has his gun drawn and he's like all right motherfucker get out you know but Ghostface floors it and hits the guy and the guy ends up on the hood and he's like holding on to the hood and Ghostface is like swerving he's driving and all this shit until eventually he comes to like this coned off area where these construction, uh, this construction area is. And he floors it and hits like this uh, something. But it's holding like these rebar bars or whatever the fuck you call them. And man, they just, they hit and all the bars come and they just go straight through the cop's fucking head as he's laying on the, uh, the hood. And it was pretty fucking brutal. Uh, and I was like, God damn, I like, I wasn't expecting scream movies to have shit like that, you know? So the cop, the cops are dead. Ghostface is knocked out, but they're in a cop car. So they can't get out through the, uh, the doors in the back. So they have to break the little barrier between them. Sydney climbs through, but the passenger door is wedged up against the wall. So she has to climb over Ghostface to get out the front or the driver's side. Before she does that, however, she starts to move her hand towards his mask to take his mask off. And the whole time her friend's like, don't do that, Sydney. Sydney, oh my God. Oh my God, don't do that, you know? Uh, and right as she like grabs it, her elbow lands on the horn and blows the horn. And so she jumps back, but Ghostface is still knocked out. So Sydney just decides to climb through the uh, the window, and her friend is like, "Don't ever fucking do that again." So Sydney ends up making it. They have it like suspenseful, like, "Oh, he's gonna wake up," but she ends up making it. Uh, but she can't open up the back door from outside either. So she's like, "You gotta go through the driver's side too," you know. Um. So the friend is like, "Fuck." So the friend climbs over. And the friend has to go over Ghostface 2. And the friend makes it. I was like, oh shit. You know, I thought for sure that he would wake up the second one. So they start to run away. And I was like, you fucking kidding me? You're not going to take off this mask now that you're out of the goddamn car? And they get, like, up the road a little bit. And then Sydney's like, wait, I got to see who's under there. And I was like, yeah, thank you. You know, and the girl's like, no, smart people leave, dumb people go back. And Sydney's like, I got to know who's under it. So Sydney goes back to the car, but Ghostface is gone. And so she's like, oh shit. And she turns around to her friend and goes, Ghost, he's gone. And the friend goes, what? And then Ghostface from the side pops out and he stabs the fuck out of the friend. 
And the friend is uh, now dead. Courtney run, or, uh, Sydney runs off. And then we go back to Courtney Cox. As she leaves the sound booth. booth, And she runs out back into like this hallway. And she runs into Cotton Weary who's there. And he's got like blood on his hands and shit. Once again, I don't know what the fuck he... He says he found Dewey. And he was coming to find her or whatever. But she's like, oh shit. So she runs outside. The... News lady who keeps trying to interview Courtney Cox is out there again with her news van. And the lady comes and grabs her radio and she radios the police. And she's like, I got a news story for you. There's fucking a dead body uh, and Cotton Weary was the murderer. And so she puts that out over the radio that Cotton Weary murdered this person. Sydney gets to the school or the theater or wherever the fuck they are right now. And uh, she comes in. And she gets to the stage, and as she's on the stage, a, everything goes in, a spotlight shines on her. Um, and then, like, the set pieces start to fall down. They start to, like, it's, like, blocking her in on the stage and shit. And then, finally, uh, the last thing to come down is the star or the sun or whatever it is, where the boyfriend is tied up. Uh, and uh, she goes over to him. And she, like, takes the tape off his mouth. And she's like, you all right and shit? She's like, we got to get out of here. Someone's trying to kill us. Uh, and then as she's saying this, Ghostface comes up behind her. And he's like, yeah, you'd hate for anything bad to happen or whatever, you know? And then uh, as he's talking, he stops using the uh, voice box thing. And they're like, hey, wait a minute. I know that voice. And then he takes off the mask. And it is Timothy Oliphant, who is the killer. Um, which, once again, you know, I mean, dude disappears. Like, after that hospital scene, he's gone. And it's like, gee, I wonder, you know, who the fucking killer could be when this guy is gone. For half of the movie. Happened to Stu in the first one. Stu goes to get beer. And then he's gone forever until he shows up. And is like, oh, Randy was the killer. You know? But still, you're like, well, hey, there's something up with this fucking news lady. You know? I like that they had Timothy Oliphant as the killer. Because it seems so obvious to me that the news lady was the killer. So to have him as like the, uh, the you know, you didn't see him coming. Even though a lot of people probably did. But... But anyway, Timothy Oliphant says to Derek, he tells Sydney that Derek is his partner. And he's like, you don't need to act anymore, Derek. We got her, you know? And he's like, don't listen to him, Sydney. But she doubts it long enough that eventually Timothy Oliphant pulls out a gun and just shoots Derek in the fucking chest and kills him. And uh, Derek is like, I never would have hurt you. And then he dies. And then he just like ascends to the sky. He gets like wheeled up. Um, or no, that might be a little, that's, that's in a little bit, but it is, but he just ascends, you know, Timothy Oliphant says he's going to blame the movies for all the killing and shit. He says he's going to hire the best lawyers and all this bullshit. He says, you know, he's just an innocent victim to cinema violence. He's been brainwashed by cinema violence and that's what caused him to do all this shit. As he's talking, she like takes off her necklace with the, uh, the frat letters and she hits him in the face and he drops the gun uh and she like kicks him one more time and she tries to run but very quickly he manages to regain control and he gets the gun back and shit and he's like ah uh-uh, sydney you're not getting away that fast you know this is when Derek's body just like ascends back up into the rafters and the dude is like uh-oh there's the surprise this is my partner and then out of the door that he points at courtney cox comes walking out and Sydney is like, what? And Courtney Cox is like shaking her head. And then from behind Courtney Cox comes this fucking news lady with a with a gun pointed at Courtney Cox. And the big twist reveal is that Sydney sees her and she goes, Mrs. Loomis? And so that's the big uh, fucking thing is that this lady is Billy's mom. And so she's here for revenge because, you know, obviously Billy's mom slept with her husband and then uh, fucking Sydney killed her son. 
and all this shit. Courtney Cox is like, well, I wrote this whole book. Why didn't I recognize her? I've seen pictures of her all, all the time. And uh, Sydney says that she's put on like 60 pounds or whatever, which I don't believe. I don't think someone could put on 60 pounds and you still want to recognize them. I think it would still be like, hey, wait a minute, you know, but whatever. So Timothy Oliphant is like, yeah, we're going to fuck you guys up. Uh, and then once again, another twist is that then Bill or Mrs. Loomis just shoots Timothy Oliphant a bunch. And she talks about how she, he was just like a pawn. Uh, also, as he shoots Timothy or Oliphant, he like pulls the trigger as he's dying and it hits uh, Courtney Cox in the side of the stomach and she falls off the stage. This is when the mom lays out the whole revenge thing. Uh, she starts blaming Sydney's mom and shit. Uh, she's like, you don't know how hard it is to be a mom. And Sydney is like, well, you abandoned your son after you divorced your, you know, where were you when he was going through all this shit, you know? Um, and then finally Sydney is like, Hey, shouldn't Mickey be dead? You know? And the Mrs. Loomis is like, what? And she turns around and fucking, uh, uh, Sydney just picks up a bottle and crashes it over her head and she runs away and locks herself in, like, the backstage area uh, where she gets an axe. And she starts cutting, like, sandbags off of the ceiling. She's cutting, like, light fixtures that are falling down and shit. She starts messing with the smoke machine and all this stuff. And eventually she chops down the building set of the castle that falls down on top of the uh, of Mrs. Loomis. Uh, and... After that, it's kind of quiet for a minute, and Sydney's like, all right. And she starts to, like, sneak down the back entrance to go to the exit. But Mrs. Loomis cuts through the uh, the curtain and starts slashing at Sydney. They fight for a while, uh, and I th she manages to get on top of Sydney, if I remember right. And then Cotton Weary shows up, and he has a gun now. I don't know where he got it. Oh, I think he, he grabbed it from uh, one of the two people. Either Mickey or uh, the girl. So Mrs. Loomis takes uh, Sydney and she like has the knife to her throat. Cotton Weary's like, hey, what the fuck is going on here, you know? Sydney's like, this is Billy's mom. She's the killer. Uh, over there, that's Mickey. He's also the killer, you know? The girl, Mrs. Loomis, tells uh, Derek, not Derek, Cotton... That, you know, she knows he wants to be the lead man and shit. But he'll never be the lead man as long as Sydney's alive. So he tells her, or he she tells him, she's like, let me kill her. And then you'll be the only survivor. And you'll be on Diane. You know, you'll be on everything. You'll be the star finally. Uh, and he, he starts to be like, oh, that sounds good, you know. But then he mentions the Diane Sawyer interview again. And he tells uh, Sydney, he's like, I bet you that Diane Sawyer interview is looking real good right about now, huh? And Sydney goes, uh, it's a deal. And so as soon as she agrees to the Diane Sawyer interview, Cotton fires off a shot. And I thought he shot Mrs. Loomis in the head, but he shot her in, like, the fucking throat. And I was like, oh, shit. Um, she goes over to Cotton, uh, and she takes the gun away from him. And then she walks over to Mrs. Loomis and like nudges her and then a hand comes up from the smoke off of the stage and grabs her like foot or whatever and they're like oh shit but it's just Courtney Cox who's still alive uh and Courtney Cox is there all three of them stand over Mrs. Loomis together they're like all right well this should be when uh she comes back to life you know but instead of her Timothy Oliphant hops up behind them and it's like oh you know and uh, Courtney Cox now, who also has a gun, her and Sydney just shoot the fuck out of them. And they kill Timothy Oliphant for good. And then Sydney turns around and shoots Mrs. Loomis in the head just one more time for good measure. Um, and the bad guys are finally dead. That night, or after that, they uh, we go outside and people are getting bandaged up. The fucking Courtney Cox's cameraman shows back up and he's like, we got a story here, you know, 
and he gives her the mic. And before she even starts to talk, she looks and she sees them bringing Dewey down on a stretcher, who's still alive. Uh, but he's all fucked up. He's like, uh, you know. <laughs> and she runs over to Dewey and she's like, you need to stay alive for me, you know. Um, and she gets into the the ambulance with Dewey and she drives away with him. Uh, Sydney, who's still there, uh, is getting interviewed by all these newsmen, newsmen, reporters, whatever the fuck you want to call them. But she is like, hey, I'm no hero. Cotton's the one who saved the day. Go interview him. Uh, and they do. And Cotton is finally the star. He's the one getting interviewed and shit. He starts talking about how, uh, you know, every interview's got a price or something. He's handing out his, uh, his business card. And then we get a, a pan out of Sydney walking in through like the courtyard. Uh, and there's like a lingering, there's like a bell tower there. And it, I kept waiting for something to happen because it was lingering there for so long. But that is the end of the movie. But then I did see that they had thought about ending it with like another ghost face watching her from the bell tower. Which I wish they would have done because I thought something was going to be there but there wasn't. Uh, but that's the end of Scream 2. This movie had a budget of $24 million. Made a box office of $172 million. So once again, raking in dough. I know this is like the opening weekend right now when I'm filming this for the new Scream. And I know that that movie is doing really well. So we'll see for Scream 3 and 4. But I think like these movies have always done pretty well at the box office. Um, none of the cast was informed about the identity of the killer until the last day of uh, principal photography. They even had like fake scripts of fake killers and all this shit. Um, this was one of the first movies I remember like had a big leak of the script where I believe the original killer was supposed to be Derek um, and maybe someone else, but they changed it. Even though uh, they do say that like that was a throw that wasn't real or whatever, but you know, who knows? Um, let's do best of worst of, I forgot to do it in the first screen, but we'll do it here. Uh, my best of for scream two is probably the, uh, the, the rebar through the head kill. It was pretty cool. Um, I can't really think of another moment, um, that I would pick, but that would be my best of worst of. The fucking, the cafeteria sing-along scene. It was terrible. Shouldn't have been here. I was glad when it was over. But, uh, but all in all, I thought Scream 2 was pretty solid. Um, like I said, it wasn't as polished as the first one, I think. But I think it was pretty solid. I think Timothy Oliphant did a good job as the killer. I know he's, he's not as, like, wild as Stu or, you know, anything, but... I think he was pretty solid in this movie with what his role was. Um, and like the, the twist of the, uh, it being Billy's mom and stuff, because the whole time it's kind of, it seemed really obvious that the news lady was the killer. So I like the twist of the, um, you know, it was the, it was her mom or Billy's mom and you know, all, all this shit. But, uh, but anyway, I look forward to Scream 3. They haven't let me down so far. I know Scream 3 is like the one that is the the one that if any of them say are bad, Scream 3 is usually the one that people say is bad. But we shall see. Uh, Friday coming out will be Don't Breathe 2. Maybe there's a chance that it might be Scream 3 if stuff falls through. We'll see. But... uh. But yeah, stay tuned for Friday with the uh, next podcast. If it's not Scream 3 on Friday, and it is Don't Breathe 2 like it's supposed to be, Scream 3 will be Monday. And then obviously the final Scream will be the Monday after that. And then we'll look at Scream 5. Um, but anyway, thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, all that good bullshit. And I'll see you guys later. Alright.